The company is now hiring. Explore exotic industrial moons. Salvage abandoned scrap and materials. And keep your earnings to spend on new gear. Just don't forget to meet the quota, or else you and your crew will be ejected into the vacuum of space. Wait, that's not what it said in the original script. Is this what happened to the last? In this video, we'll be going over some basic elements of rocket science, aerodynamics, and spaceship design, as illustrated by the dropship in Lethal Company. After playing and enjoying this game a lot recently, I figured this would be a fun way to illustrate some of these concepts that are used in the space industry, which I've been studying recently as part of my master's degrees in space studies and mechanical engineering. I'll be keeping things fairly high level to avoid needing to go into excessive math, but if you would like any more detail on any of these topics, feel free to ask a question in the comments, and I can do my best to try to explain further. Also, if there are any mistakes I've made that you notice, please leave a comment about that as well. Let's start with a quick overview of force vectors. Rocket engines produce thrust by creating an equal and opposite force to the hot gases being exhausted through the nozzle. This thrust does not necessarily need to be in the direction you want to go, though. To produce thrust in a particular direction, you can use a resultant force that is composed of other forces. The components of multiple forces acting in the same direction can be added together to produce a larger force. In spaceship design, this means that you can achieve a forward force with multiple engines that are aiming in different directions, if they still produce component forces in the direction you want to move. Using this principle, we can see that the arrangement of the engines underneath the dropship is able to produce upwards thrust if all the engines are firing equally. However, we can also see that this arrangement would not be capable of providing forwards thrust, at least not without rotating the ship, which might work well enough, but we don't see that behavior in-game. Also, just as a point of reference, I'm going to be considering the end of the ship with the door to be forward, since that's the direction the ship flies in during its landing approach. There are at least two ways of getting around this. The first and more obvious is the use of another rocket engine facing in the appropriate direction. So on the dropship, we could just add another engine to face forward or backwards. Now this would work well enough for simply flying forwards or backwards in a straight line. However, it might also be necessary to provide smaller forces in other directions to maneuver the ship, or to aid during landing. For this application, we can use what's called Reaction Control Systems, or RCS. These are smaller, lower power rocket engines that are primarily used to provide maneuvering thrust. Again, using composition of forces, by adding small amounts of thrust in a different direction, the direction of the overall resultant force can be adjusted. So if we were to include a rearward thruster in the dropship, we could use RCS thrusters, or even the landing thrusters, to change the direction of the flight. We would also probably want to add thrusters onto the top of the ship to allow us to get a downward force for this purpose. We could also add a forward-facing thruster too to slow down the ship when it can't be slowed enough by air resistance, and to allow flying in the reverse direction. The other way of changing the direction of the dropship's flight would be the use of thrust vectoring controls. These systems angle the nozzle of the engine slightly to change the direction of its thrust, which can then be used to control the ultimate direction of the ship. If the dropship's engines are capable of rotating far enough to face backwards, they could provide thrust to move the ship forwards, although we don't really see this too much during takeoff in the game at least. Another issue with this approach is that unless the engines are rotated significantly, the adjusted thrust would only produce slight forward motion, and probably not move us as fast as we'd like to go. While we're on the topic of rocket engines, we can try to deduce what kind of engines the dropship uses based on their appearance and behavior in the game. Since they can be started and stopped, and throttled down for landing, these are most likely going to be liquid propellant rocket engines, which use a combination of liquid fuel and oxidizer to create a combustion reaction, which produces hot gases that are exhausted out the nozzle. This is opposed to a solid rocket motor, which uses a mixture of fuel and oxidizer in solid form, which then burns to create these hot gases. We can also deduce from this red component at the top of the nozzle that these engines operate on an open cycle. In most turbopump-driven liquid propellant rocket engines, which are the majority of liquid engines, some of the hot gases from either the primary or a secondary combustion process are used to drive a turbopump that will move propellants into the primary combustion chamber. In a closed cycle, after spinning the turbine in the turbopump, these hot gases are then returned to the combustion chamber to be fed through the nozzle and produce additional thrust. This is as opposed to an open cycle, in which this hot gas is dumped into the nozzle further downstream, or just vented out into space. This red circular component, then, is likely a manifold through which the hot gases are being injected into the nozzle as part of an open engine cycle. 
We can also note these ridges on the outside of the nozzle. On many rocket engines, reinforcing bands are used to restrict the thermal expansion of the nozzle as it's heating up. This prevents the overall shape of the nozzle from deforming too much while it's firing. From here we'll switch gears a bit to cover the aerodynamics of the dropship. Whenever a spacecraft enters an atmosphere, it will most likely be traveling at hypersonic speed, as it slows down from orbital velocities. An important phenomenon associated with high-speed flight, such as during orbital re-entry, is the formation of shock waves, which results from air slowing down upon encountering a fast-moving object. The shape of a shock wave is dependent on the shape of the object in flight. A rounded or blunted object will produce a detached bow shock, while a pointed object will produce an attached shock. These attached shocks are especially concerning as significant aerodynamic heating can occur at the point of attachment, which can quickly damage that part of the vehicle structure. On the other hand, bow shocks produce greater aerodynamic drag on the vehicle, which requires more thrust, and thus more fuel, to overcome. Depending on their geometry, shockwaves that collide with other shockwaves can also produce even greater aerodynamic heating and material stresses in the vehicle structure. To avoid these negative effects of shockwaves, then, supersonic and hypersonic vehicles need to balance sharpness and bluntness of leading edges to avoid creating excessive drag and aerodynamic heating. In the case of the company dropship, we have a mostly blunt forward surface that would produce a bow shock. However, the railings and walkway at the front of the ship are small enough to produce additional shocks that could intersect with or disrupt the bow shock, potentially leading to shock-shock interactions that could damage the front of the ship. Also, depending on their exact shape, the railing shocks could also become attached and rapidly overheat the railings, which could melt or ablate their outer surface. This would also be a concern for the antenna at the top of the ship and the engines at the bottom. Additionally, the door mechanism could be compromised by excessive heating unless it is properly shielded. However, the properties of these shockwaves would also depend on the thickness of the atmosphere of the moon being visited. So, if the density of the air is low enough, there may not be sufficient air resistance to create much of a shockwave in front of the vehicle, and so this problem might not be as much of a concern on moons with thinner atmospheres. Let's switch gears one more time to consider the interior of the ship. Human factors is an important aspect of spaceship design that focuses on the interactions between the ship and its crew. Space is a harsh enough place to be as it is, so human-centered design attempts to improve the experience of a human crew in space to allow them to work more effectively and with reduced psychological stress. With that in mind, the design of the company dropship is not stellar in this regard. There's only one room for up to four crew members to occupy for an extended period of time, and it is quite small for this purpose, although being able to go outside often would reduce the severity of this problem. The sleeping bunks are also rather cramped, but at the very least they do have restraints to prevent injuries during flight. There's also a noticeable lack of windows, but at least we do have a monitor and camera to view the exterior in some way. Also, this lack of windows does help improve the structural integrity of the ship, so it does make sense in that regard. We also have the door to consider. The human body is susceptible to a variety of negative biological effects when encountering a sudden change in pressure, and precautions need to be taken when transitioning from a high to low pressure environment, or vice versa. This can most easily be seen in diving operations, where divers must transition between high pressures underwater to sea level atmospheric pressure above the water. This transition must be performed slowly to prevent decompression sickness. Normally in a spaceship or station, there would be one room at normal or standard air pressure, and another room in the pressure of the suits to be worn during the spacewalk. In the company ship, however, we only have one room and one door, meaning that the pressure of the whole cabin would need to be adjusted before each departure and after each arrival. Depending on the internal pressure of the spacesuits, this might not be as much of a concern, though. If the suit is pressurized to the same degree as the cabin, we would only need to wait for the room to repressurize after sealing the door before doffing the suit. Oh, shoot. And finally, on the topic of cabin pressure, we can also take a look at the company's disciplinary measures. In order for a person to get blown out of an airlock like we see in the game, and numerous sci-fi movies and TV, there would need to be a sufficient amount of air moving at high enough speed to push somebody out through an opening. This is usually not the case in pressurized rooms in spacecraft, but this phenomenon has actually occurred on several occasions, sometimes with lethal results. In the case of the company dropship, we could suppose that before the door is opened to space the crew, the air pressure in the room is increased well beyond standard levels, which could produce a strong enough force to cause all crew members to be ejected. 
Now, given our limited information on this dropship, I'm gonna have to leave it there for this video. Hopefully though, this was a nice glimpse into some of the basics of rocket science and what goes into engineering these sort of vehicles. But like I mentioned, if you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment and I'll do my best to provide more detail. Also, if you enjoyed this look at some of the science and engineering behind science fiction video games, I have a few more longer videos like this that go into a lot more detail. So if that sounds interesting, feel free to check out those other videos, and also feel free to subscribe if you'd like to be notified next time I have one of these reviews ready to go, or when I have another project to share. For now though, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you learned something from my time at the company. So with all that said, thank you very much for watching.